I hope you all have that drink handy, because we are back for part two. To recap the first episode, we covered the beginning of Ukrainian history, as far back as the woolly mammoths and through to the height of the Cuban Rus, and the conversion of Volodymyr the Great to Christianity. Now, I know I left you on a bit of a cliffhanger last time with the birth of Genghis Khan, and I'm somewhat sorry for that, but it is time to continue where we left off, at the very height of the Cuban Rus. The term Cuban Rus is a modern term, like the Byzantines, that we have co-opted into the modern era to denote the time period. The people at the time did not refer to themselves as Cuban Rusian for one. The term though describes the period of power between the 10th and 13th centuries, where the rulers of Kiev stabilised their realm and ruled the semi loose confederacy. The argument on who owns their legacy, who is the true Rus people, well it has dominated, for totally political reasons, the last 250 years of academia in the region. I submit through my own research that nobody does, that history has moved on from claiming a true successor, and like Rome, the empire that was is now gone, and the respective cultures have evolved. History teaches us very clearly, and in part two we will outline this. Yaroslav the Wise, possibly the most famous of all the Rus leaders, is a prime example of just how the Rus is claimed by both Ukraine and Russia. As a Kievan prince buried in Kiev at the church he built in Kiev, the distinction is rather obvious that he was, in fact, a Kievan prince. However, various historians and politicians, such as those who write their own wish.com Mein Kampf, try to claim differently. The argument really stems from how you view the advent of these princes and the Rus itself. If you consider the argument that they are Scandinavian and that they settled the region as a ruling elite, then you have a pretty simple answer. On the contrary though, there is a significant group of people including the aforementioned Wish.com Kump writer who argues that the only relevant factor is that the princes of the Rus are clearly from Novgorod, which is in modern day Russia, so Russia is clearly the only true successor. Both of these perspectives in my opinion are far too politically charged to be taken very seriously, and based on the factual evidence we have available, Yaroslav the Wise was a prince of the Kievan Rus, ruling from the city of Kiev. He was the ruler of a Rus, a state which spawned the building blocks of future nation states. I would come to be call him the Charlemagne of Eastern Europe, Charlemagne being an emperor who was not French, not German, but Frankish, a subculture group which no longer exists but who many are descended from. Yaroslav the Wise was undoubtedly a vital part of Russian history. This is an undisputed fact, as upon his death according to the Primary Chronicle, the lands were divided, with the great capital being both in the principalities of Novgorod in what is today modern Russia, and Kiev in modern Ukraine and southern Belarusia. In all, Yaroslav died with five living sons, and each inherited power in a different region. But it devolved into a triumvirate of three main princes, the eldest sons, sharing power. The connection of Yaroslav to Ukraine, though, when compared to Russia, is even more undoubtable, especially when one considers his contributions to Ukrainian history through architecture, culture, and religion. Upon his death in 1054, Yaroslav's remains were laid to rest in a marble coffin, possibly taken from an earlier sacking of Constantinople by Rus' Vikings and he remained there until his body vanished in 1943 during the German occupation of the city. By some accounts, his body was taken by the Ukrainian Orthodox diaspora in the United States, who, having fled the Soviet Union, organized the theft of the body to preserve it due to the fear of what the advancing Red Army might do. There is a significant rumor as well that the body of Yaroslav the Wise may in fact today lay in the Church of the Holy Trinity in Brooklyn, New York. Yaroslav the Wise, along with Volodymyr the Great, are two of the most integral parts of the telling of the Kievan Rus' history, and their successors would see the land remain in what could be almost described as a state of perpetual crisis and civil war, where conflict was the order of the day. Each prince who vied for power, though, they all seemed to want to control Kiev, as it was the traditional centre of power for Rus leaders. Think of it like Rome during the height of the empire. Practically, it was not the be-all and end-all and quite pointless. Sure, it was a great river crossing and immense city, but there were others. On the contrary, though, politically and culturally, it was vital. This all changed in 1169, when Prince Andrei Boglupsky, vying for power, sent his son to seize the city and plunder it. After two days of looting, the army withdrew, and the princes declared the city of Volodymyr, today's Vladimir, just northeast of Moscow, to be his capital. This radical act signaled that the Cuban world was truly coming to an end, and allowed for other Cuban princes to begin their rise in prestige and power, as in the west, the city of Halek in Galicia Volhynia began its entrance to the stage, growing rich of the trade routes of the Dniester River. The looting of Kiev was just the first example of how the principalities that once made up the Rus began to truly fall apart in the 12th century, 
The once great city in which St. Olher had ruled as the first Christian leader was now in decline. More and more often, rulers of cities such as Chernihiv would inherit their lands from their fathers and see themselves as members of the larger Kievan Rus, loyal to their home cities above all, and they desired more and more individual power and wealth. The looting also saw the removal of religious artifacts and icons from Kiev, and they found their way into the new capital in the north. Prince Andrei was intent on snubbing the old capital and rebuilding his city and its image, going so far as to contact the Byzantines in an attempt to have his city recognised. For all intents and purposes, the confederation which had morphed into a semi-unified entity was on its last legs, and on December 7th, 1240, the Kievan Rus would fall entirely when the Mongol hordes took the city of Kiev and put it to the torch. Europe had seen multiple invasions in the years leading up to the Golden Horde's great trek west, the most famous of which being the Huns, Avars, and the Goths, peoples we have touched on and spoken about at length during the first part. But perhaps the greatest shock to the system of both European and Asian worlds in human history, maybe even more so than that of the World Wars, was the arrival of the Mongols, a seemingly unstoppable force hell-bent on nothing but destruction, the kind of thing the Bible warns of in the faithful fear. I cannot even begin to understate just how terrifying the Mongol invasions were to the people at the time. It was truly as if hell had risen up. They seemed essentially completely unstoppable, and if there was a piece of land between you and them, it was only a matter of time. As the gateway to Europe, the steppe would prove to be the great highway for the Horde on its ride west. Some 13 years after the death of Genghis, his grandson Batu Khan invaded the Rus. After sending envoys to the court of Grand Prince Michael of Chernihiv and receiving their bodies back as a reply, the Khan sacked Chernihiv and continued his ride west, reaching Kiev on the 28th of November 1240. With the Grand Prince having fled and his successor Rotislav overthrown by the Prince of Galicia Volhynia, Kiev stood relatively defenceless. Of some 1,000 defenders, it is said that they died to a man alongside a wholesale slaughter of 48,000 civilians. Galicia Volhynia would be subjugated as a tributary, like Wolodmir in the east and the other once great Rus states, and the great era of the Kievan Rus was now finally at an end. By all accounts, the once great city of Yaroslav the Wise and Volodymyr the Great was nothing more than a shell of its former self, a ghost town, with those who remained nothing more than slaves. It is here in our narrative that the mantle of Rus comes into conjecture as two entities now enter the forefront of our narrative, two entities that in time will form the crux of three modern countries. The Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia, better known as the Kingdom of Ruthenia, and the Grand Principality of Muscovy now had their respective turns to rise on the world stage. But, and this is a big but, we need to pause for a second here to discuss something. This series is a history of Ukraine, not a history of Russia. And so naturally I want to focus the narrative on the evolution of the Ruthenians and not the Muscovites. However, due to a short and grumpy dictator who claims they are the same thing, but not really, but yes, but no, his book is an interesting one, I give it that, I will have to also cover at a glance what exactly was going on in Muscovy at the time. This will chop up the narrative a bit, and for that I apologise, but just be aware that I will need to jump over to Muscovy occasionally to cover some things, to ensure that when we get to the bit with the two interacting, we don't wait in blind. The Mongols recognised two distinctly different principalities inside of the Rus, the aforementioned Galicia Volhynia, but also Vladimir Suzdal. Recognising the change in the region's power structure, the Byzantines followed suit, and recognised the two centres of power. The princes who ruled these respective regions were both descended from the once great Cuban Rus, and inherited the language and culture of the old empire. However, the trajectory these two states would take would differ immensely, as would the nature of their relationship with their new Mongol overlord. In the lands of Vladimir Suzdal, and I have swapped to the Russian naming system here to note the divergence, the Mongols' influence would last until the end of the 15th century, and would become known as the infamous Tartar Yoke. In Galicia Volhynia, though, on the other hand, on the very outskirts of the Mongol world, the situation was vastly different, with Mongol rule ending in the mid-4th century, and by and large, being far less oppressive than in the East. We now reach a point in history where we encounter one of the first great myths of Russification, Russian scholars in the 19th century, a time we will get to where the order of the day by the Tsar was to turn the Ukrainians into good little Russians, perpetuated the myth that the Rus who lived in Kiev fled east into the Volga and Oka basins to find refuge from the Mongols. Just to reiterate, 
The argument they made was that the, in order to feel safe, the refugees fled the Mongols into Mongol territory, rather than living in the western half of what we would now consider modern Ukraine and Moldova. It should be noted that in these regions today in Ukraine, the oldest examples of Ukrainian dialects and Rus dialects exist, not in the Volga and Oka basins. There's probably a reason for that now, isn't there? Yaroslav of Vladimir was the first of the Rus princes to swear fealty to the Mongols, and he and his son Alexander Nevsky would remain loyal to the Mongol rulers, Nevsky himself being made a saint by the Russian Orthodox Church for his role in defending the region against Swedes and Teutonic Knights. However, in the West, Prince Danilo of Halek took a different approach, swearing fealty, but not remaining loyal for long. Rus chronicles note that Danilo took the opportunity of Mongol suzerainty over the region to assert his dominance of the region and rebuild the economic prosperity of what now can be clearly called Ruthenians. Under his leadership, refugees from the east were encouraged to move west, and Ruthenia would find itself in a state of what can only be really described as purgatory. Too weak to fight the Mongols alone, but strong enough to be useful to the Mongols to stop itself from being conquered by outside powers. And this continued until the end of the 13th century, when the Mongol presence became less and less evident in this, their westernmost tributary. By 1246, while on the return journey from a meeting with Batu Khan, Danilo encountered the papal envoy Giovanni del Carpini, and the two discussed the possibility of opening Ruthenian discussions with the papacy. Upon the prince's return to Galicia, he sent an envoy to Lyon, where Pope Innocent IV had taken up residence, to make direct contact. The Pope's demand was simple. He wanted the rulers in the East to recognise the dominant position of the papacy as the supreme religious leader of the Christian world, and Danilo, he wanted assistance from the powerful Catholic rulers in Europe to break away from Mongol rule. The contract between Danilo and the papacy was agreed upon in 1253, and the Pope sent a representative east, naming Danilo King Daniel, King of the Rus, and calling for a crusade against the Mongols. Danilo was then able to marry his children into the Hungarian and Austrian ruling families, and with this backing, he began military action against the Mongol hordes, capturing large regions and building more and more defences timing this offensive perfectly with the death of Batu Khan. After some years and a small succession crisis, the Mongols, though, returned. And the Western support that had been promised to King Daniel never came, alone and forced to stand against the Mongol hordes with no support whatsoever from his Western allies. He had no choice but to bend the knee. The alliance with the Catholic West had another major consequence, one which is still very much felt today. In 1204, members of the Fourth Crusade sacked the city of Constantinople after being shortchanged by the Byzantine ruler. The relationship between Eastern and Western Christianity was now not a matter of theology, but one of extreme violence. In 1251, Danilo's former bishop travelled to Constantinople for a blessing, and he was confined for the crime of serving a ruler who was conspiring with the Pope. Released only when he was willing to accept Vladimir Suzdal as the correct seat for Orthodox Christianity, and in 1299, Constantinople would make the transfer of the sea official, with a later ruler moving the sea again from Vladimir to Moscow. The decision to move the Holy See of the Rus Church, made by the Byzantines, was done solely out of spite for Danilo's relationship with the papacy. The Mongols, for their part, created the title of Grand Prince of Rus to assist in managing the region, and this title was originally given to the rulers of Vladimir, but two new major cities would rise to contest the title, Moscow and Tver. With the Metropolitan of all Rus now in Moscow, the Holy See, it was only a matter of time until the new rulers of the city consolidated their power as the Mongols' chosen Grand Prince of Rus. Naturally, the Ruthenians weren't entirely impressed, and recognising that they were two steps short of losing control over the entire region, the Byzantines approved the creation of a second Metropolitan in Galicia. Colloquially, this has been known to history as the Metropolitan of Little Rus. And this ultimately is where the term comes from, the fact of the matter is that at this point in history is where Ukraine is ultimately born. Russia, too, with their respective regions, church structures, and governments, with the future Ukraine building its identity linked to the West and the future Russia in the East. The Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia ended its run as an independent entity in 1323 with the deaths of both the grandsons of Danilo, possibly in battle. With the royal house dying out and no more maternal descendants, the line of succession was at an end. The maternal nephew, the Polish prince Bolslaw of Mazovia, stepped in and was proclaimed ruler, converting from Catholicism to Orthodoxy and taking the name Yuri. In 1340, the boyars, the ruling elite across Galicia Volhynia, having grown wary of the Polish prince and his perceived inability to listen to their complaints, poisoned their liege, 
and this led to a period of struggle for the leadership of the region. A struggle that ended with the disillusionment of Galicia Volhynia. In the final part of the 14th century, the once great principality was split, with Galicia falling under the rule of the Kingdom of Poland, and Volhynia falling under the rule of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Poles would incorporate Galicia by 1430, through the extensive settlement of Polish nobility, drawn to the area with the promise of new lands in return for service. The Lithuanians, on the other hand, had a different policy when it came to ruling their new territories, which grew to include the once great city of Kiev itself. The Lithuanians in many ways can be seen as having gone native when it comes to their rule over the Rus, truly assimilating the cultural groups into what some historians have dubbed the Lithuania Rus polity. The two entities, Poland and Lithuania, would rule in different ways, but the fact of the matter remained. The time of the Rus was at an end, and the leadership of Ruthenia, now sometimes being referred to by a new term that had made its way into the history books Ukraine, now fell again to a foreign ruler. In 1385, in the now Belarusian town of Kreva, the 33-year-old Grand Duke of Lithuania and Lord of Rus, Dragalia, signed a decree with the attendance of the representatives of the 12-year-old Queen of Poland that amounted to the medieval equivalent of a prenup. A series of further agreements would occur, and in 1569, the Union of Lublin created the entity, for all intents and purposes, that we now know as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And once again, after being split at the fall of Galicia Volhynia, the land of Ukraine was now united under a single entity. Granted, it was a foreign entity, but unity had again occurred. A key distinction was made at the birth of the Commonwealth that had profound effects on life today in the region. The northern lands, modern Belarusia, became integral parts of Lithuania, and the southern lands, mostly Ukraine, were still part of Lithuania, but started to become more and more under Polish influence. And this is where our story starts to get complicated. Following the unification of the two realms, the new ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth invited, and I'm using a certain level of air quotations here, the Lithuanian nobility to adopt coat of arms from the Polish nobility, blending the ruling families of the Great Kingdom together into a unified elite. This was not the most effective form of cultural moulding, as the individual regions still maintained their individual identities and cultures. But crucially, this great moulding of culture held one exclusion, no orthodoxy. The Rus leaders, although nominally accepting of the pivot towards the West for pragmatic reasons during the reign of Danilo, had largely retained their faith, and they were treated as such as outsiders during this period, never really able to assimilate within the Commonwealth. If this insult wasn't antagonistic enough to the Rus nobility, Successive leaders of the Commonwealth began to enact policies to cut down the semblance of Rus autonomy and self-identity. The Union of Haroldo was enacted shortly after the beginning of the sharing of nobility, and this act replaced the Volhynian prince, a princedom which had been at the very heart of the Rus, with an outsider. Following the death of the Grand Duke in 1430, the Rus nobles backed their own candidate to the throne, and due to their support, they were rewarded with receiving the same rights and privileges outlined in the earlier Union, that were once excluded due to their orthodox faith. But this was merely a speed bump for those in the royal court who were intent on breaking up Rus' power. In 1470, Casimir IV took the drastic step of dissolving the Principality of Kiev in the great attempt to finally destroy the last vestiges of Rus' power. Ten years later, the Kievan princes who remained nominally in power in their own regions plotted to kill Casimir, but this plot failed, and the ringleaders were captured or forced to flee entirely. With this, the last chance that an independent state seemed to vanish, as the Commonwealth strove further to extend its power over the former Rus, and by the turn of the 16th century, the entirety of the Rus has seemingly vanished. But, and again, this is another big but, the language, the culture, and the people remained. And this was the period that made Ukraine. There is a common theme across Europe during the 16th century, and that is the increasement of autocratic power from individual rulers. We see this across the continent with the Habsburgs in Spain, the Tudors in England, and of course the rulers in Muscovy. The Poles grew during this time to dominate the Commonwealth, and as the Lithuanians were forced to turn their attention to the east to face a newly resurgent threat in that very same form of Muscovy. A little further back in history in the year 1476, the Grand Prince Ivan III of Muscovy took the opportunity of a weakened Mongol horde to declare his independence, and he launched what has been dubbed a Gathering of Rus. Styling himself as the Tsar, he took the lands of Novgorod, Tver, and Vyatka. Further to this, he laid the claim that he was the sole ruler of all lands of the former Kievan Rus. 
It is worth noting at this time, 200 years have passed since the Mongol hordes broke the Rus apart. The Grand Dukes of Lithuania, ruling over the heartland of the Old Rus and their local Rus princes, would now enter into a prolonged conflict over the title and mantle of true Rus successor, and following a series of conflicts in the early 16th century, the Grand Dukes were forced to recognise Muscovite rule over Smolensk and Chernihiv. This was the first time in history that Muscovite rule was imposed on the territory of what is today modern Ukraine. The Grand Dukes of Lithuania's true concern though was not really Muscovy, rather it was Poland, which had grown to dominate the Commonwealth. In an interesting divergent point in history, and I hinted at this before, the Polish nobility had slowly begun to use their dominance of the Commonwealth to transfer control of lands that roughly bank up modern Ukraine to Polish dominion, officially rather than just through influence. Leaving the lands of what we now consider Belarusia within the realm of Lithuania, and the lands of what we now call Ukraine, under Polish rule. It is here at this critical juncture in the 16th century that we see the birth of Belarusian independence as a unique culture and unique group. Because although this might be the history of Ukraine, Belarusia is not Russian either. It has sadly been Russified into a point of almost non-existence and we are genuinely in the final stages of our chance to save this unique important language and culture, but it is just a worthwhile note to stop, pause and mention Belarusia is its own country and its own culture, and a lot of the divergence was caused when Poland and Lithuania started to split the land. But I digress. In this new entity, the Ukrainian princes suddenly found themselves on the proverbial gold mine of agricultural production and trade, and they grew so wealthy that, for a time, individual personal fiefdoms in the region, ruled by Ukrainian princes, could fund the Commonwealth's annual budget for multiple years alone. It is around this time that the term Ukraine really begins to appear on maps more and more often, and as such I have swapped using the term now and I will continue to use the term going forward. Ruthenia may come back once or twice as we get into the modern era, but for all intents and purposes we will now be using the term Ukraine in our history. The Ukrainian prince's power and prestige continued to grow into the 17th century, and it was during this time that the term Polish Rus entered the phrasebook as a way to describe the orthodox lands ruled by the Poles. Within this great Polish Rus, the wealthy leaders sponsored arts, cultural works, maps, plays, music, and construction, taking their newfound position of power and wealth in the wake of the realignment of the Polish and Lithuanian worlds to dominate their specific regions. Although they didn't know it yet, the unique culture that they helped build would give rise to the uniqueness of Ukrainian culture, built on the foundations of Olha of Kiev, Vladimir the Great, and Yaroslav the Wise, and then built around the very structure and framework laid down by Danilo of Halek and the Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia. It was during this time that Ukraine was born, and it must be noted, Russia too was born. They were now two different entities, with a destined fate to be intertwined as Muscovy looked west, claiming itself to be the restorer of a world that quite frankly no longer existed, that had evolved over 200 years into something new, and right in the middle were a group of people descended from the ancient hordes, Slavs, and the Rus, famously adept at their skill of fighting. In the background of the changes leading up to the 17th century, in the year 1492, the Catholic monarchs of Spain expelled the last Islamic kingdom. Columbus landed in the New World, and onto the stage came a people who would completely rewrite the history of Eastern Europe and would help make Ukraine a reality. Onto the stage came the Cossacks, and although their presence began in the 15th century as I just mentioned, it would be in the 17th century where they would make their presence known as the Zaporizhian host. This part has taken us from the height of the Rus in the 12th century, all the way through to the beginning of Cossack dominance in the 17th century. We have covered a lot of ground in the first two parts of this series, and from now things will begin to slow down a little, as the next part will cover the period of Imperial Russian rule, the Cossacks, their wars against Imperial Russian rule, and the vicious cycle that began and has become known to us as Rusification, ending likely at the turn of the 20th century, just in time for us to get very depressed in a fourth part talking about the First World War. I want to give a special shout out just quickly to um, Anna, her Twitter handle is Ukrainian Anna. She helped me a lot with the pronunciation during this episode, and I know it's not perfect, but she really did help me out, especially with Danilo. I was going to say it so, so differently, so thank you. And I want to say thank you to all the positive comments on part one. That really does mean a lot to me, and I intend to continue this series weekly as best I can until we're done. Thank you again to my awesome patrons, channel members, and supporters. Like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord, Patreon link in the bio, and I'll catch you all in about a week with part three. Thank you.